This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. I'm a professor of anthropology at Oregon State University. I do research in a part of Northeast Siberia uh, called the Kamchatka Peninsula. So some people may uh, not be too familiar with the Kamchatka Peninsula. So I'll just kind of um, try to go through that a little bit. Um, so uh, I, Kamchatka is a large peninsula about the size of California. It's very remote. Um, about two thirds of the population lives in a single metropolitan area near the southern tip. And most of my work occurs in the north in some small villages that range in size between 200 and about 1,000 people. Uh, they're accessible mostly only by aircraft or boat. Um, the majority of the residents of these villages are indigenous peoples, uh, including Koryaks, Chukchis, Iveni. Um, the traditional subsistence activities for these people are reindeer herding and salmon fishing. Um, and that's usually what my research focuses on. I was partly drawn to study these ways of life uh, because reindeer and salmon are also classic common pool resources, so appropriate for this webinar series. Um, as we know, common pool resources are interesting in part because they pose special problems for resource governance. Although each person's use of a CPR affects the abilities of others to use the resource, it's also very difficult to regulate how people use the CPR. So understanding how people can overcome these dilemmas has proven difficult for both scholars and practitioners alike. But at the same time, of course, solving the problems is tremendously important, especially in places where commons are seen as vulnerable to various forces of social and environmental change. And uh, that's certainly the case in Kamchatka. So in terms of reindeer herding, herd sizes have declined dramatically since the collapse of the Soviet economy. Herders are struggling to maintain herding as a viable profession and a way of life in the new market economy. And also, Kamchatka salmon fisheries are threatened uh, by increases in poaching and illicit trade in ca salmon caviar. Um, this has attracted a variety of governmental and non-governmental organizations uh, drawn to Kamchatka in an effort to protect what they perceive as vulnerable natural and economic resources, the salmon populations. So of course, this is a really complicated problem as is in many places, and I won't go into it in too much detail, but I do wanna highlight the important role of institutions in dealing with these problems. So in many cases, these problems are exacerbated by broad disconnects between the formal regulatory institutions that manage, for example, salmon quotas and more informal institutions, cultural norms and values that are at the heart of subsistence activities in rural communities. These informal institutions have been shaped by legacies of cooperation that extend back to the Soviet and pre-Soviet eras. And this is also another big topic that I probably can't do justice to today, uh, but I do wanna go into a little bit of the history of institutions in Kamchatka that govern these commons um, to provide some context for the work I am gonna talk about. So prior to the Soviet era, fishers and herders uh, were relatively autonomous foragers who worked collectively in groups of, of kin and, and territorial co-residents and held property in common in a kind of institution that Russian ethnographers called the Abshina. Uh, then during the Soviet era, the Soviet government collectivized fishing and herding. And so forming institutions, uh, state farms, collective farms that became the focal points of social and economic life uh, in rural villages where I work. So this lasted for many decades until about the 1990s when the Soviet economy began to collapse and reorganize. During this time period, some of these Soviet collective institutions were privatized, especially salmon fishing collectives. Others were liquidated entirely, deemed unprofitable, and, and had their, their materials sold off. While still others, especially reindeer herding collectives, managed to find ways to remain government institutions, albeit without the kinds of subsidies and support that they enjoyed during the Soviet era. So today, what we have is a great deal of institutional diversity in Kamchatka, and this provides us a unique opportunity to understand how institutional designs emerge from the kinds of contingent cultural and historical contexts uh, that are important everywhere um, and impact commons governance. 
So with that in mind, um, I want to take a step back and talk about my framing of the issue in terms of my research. So I'm generally interested uh, from a theoretical perspective in cooperation and collective action. And a lot of that work starts with just a basic question. How do people reconcile individual and common interests? We can see this question applying to a variety of social contexts, ranging from the kinds of social networks that form the core of subsistence practices like fishing and herding. So people who work together in fish camps, people who produce resources, people who share them throughout the community to support people and help them get by. And this extends all the way up to the institutions that help coordinate these activities and the broader social movements in which these institutions are embedded. So my work in these contexts uh, generally echoes the message from decades of research on the commons, highlighting the crucial role that institutions play as nexus points, connecting patterns of cooperation at local levels within these kinds of subsistence networks to broader social movements that extend far beyond these communities and in, indeed these days uh, extend to global scales. So with that in mind, I also wanted to say a little bit about my approach to dealing with these questions. Um, I take a mixed methods approach. So my philosophy is that every methodology has its strengths and weaknesses. And so I try to combine different methods so that hopefully the strengths of these methods uh, complement each other and work together synergistically. So um, I've listed a couple of them up there today, um, or, but I'm gonna focus mostly today on the field experiments that I've done. Um, but I'll also try to indicate connections to other methods and the kind of iterative process of doing mixed methods work, moving back and forth between different methodologies, for example, between experiments and interviews or participant observation. So uh, for my dissertation, uh, one part of my project, I did uh, uh, experimental economic game called the public goods game. I think many people are familiar with it. Uh, the structure of the public goods game is intended in some ways to be uh, a model of a kind of uh, commons and the dilemmas people face. And what I did is I did the standard public goods game where we have four people who are each given an endowment. They're uh, asked to decide how much of that endowment to contribute to their group. The amount that they contribute to their group is doubled and then divided equally among everyone in the group regardless of how much they contributed. So the idea is that there's a collective good by contributing to the group, and then everyone receives access to that good. But of course, it's possible for people to free ride on that and not contribute to the group and still receive a benefit from whatever the group earns. So that's the standard public goods game. Um, and what I did is I combined that with two additional versions of the public goods game, where the structure of the game is identical but instead of describing an abstract group fund as in a standard public goods game, we describe the fund as uh, in reference to these post-Soviet collective institutions with the idea of looking at how that institutional framing affects people's decisions in the context of the game. So we did this with about 70 participants in two villages in Kamchatka, randomly assigning people to one of these treatments. It was a one-shot public public goods game, everyone's choices were kept confidential. And I won't go into all the details, but one of the key results that came out of this is that contributions in the public goods game um, were quite large uh, relative to other places, uh, similar contexts where ethnographers, anthropologists had done these experiments um, throughout the world. So typically we see contributions averaging uh, in the range of 40 to 60% to the public good. And in Kamchatka, in the standard version, we found an average of about 89%. So very high levels of contributions was the first main result, uh, perhaps indicating that cooperation is very important for people in Kamchatka. We compare the different treatments, what we found is that the contributions were significantly lower in the versions of the games that were framed in relation to these collective institutions. So compared to uh, on average around close to 100% in the standard version it goes down to about 87, 83% in the framed versions of the games. So um, one of the interpretations of this is that people seem to have a little bit less confidence in contributing to the group when the game is framed in relation to these Soviet collective institutions. Um, another interesting angle on this result is we looked at how framing the game uh, shaped people's 
perceptions or expectations about what other people would contribute in their group and how that interacted with what they contributed themselves. So you can see it visually represented here. Um, we have a person's expected contribution, what they expect other people to give on the x-axis, and what they choose to contribute themselves on the y-axis. So in the standard version of the game, lots of people are contributing 100% regardless of how much they expect others to contribute. Or in other words, even when they expect other people only to contribute half of their endowment to the group, they're still contributing 100% themselves. So it's very generous behavior. In the framed version, however, what you see is that as expectations diminish, we see contributions also diminish. So people who are expecting lower contributions from others also contribute less themselves. And it's important to keep in mind that contributions are still really high in the frame version, so it's a relative uh, decrease. But this relationship between expectations and contributions helps kind of highlight some of the different strategies that people might be taking in the game and helps us kind of maybe understand uh, what they were thinking about when they made their decision. So I put up this conceptual diagram here to illustrate where with the line marked X, we can see somebody who is very altruistic or very generous, they're contributing the full amount regardless of what they expect others to do. The opposite, uh, line Z, somebody contributing nothing regardless of what they expect others to do. So someone who is uh, not contributing to the public good, maybe selfish. And then that middle diagonal line, Y, would be sort of a perfect conditional cooperator, um, somebody who contributes exactly what they expect others to contribute. So with that in mind, um, what we find in terms of these results is that generally people are, in all versions, uh, moving towards the more uh, altruistic or more generous line um, in terms of their relationships. But in the frame version, we also see some people moving towards that conditional cooperation. So something about the institutional context is causing them to weigh their cooperation against what they expect others to do. Perhaps this reflects um, some of the uncertainty that these institutions are facing in the post-Soviet era is the interpretation. So this analysis so far is just focusing on the game results, but I also did a lot of interviews with people after the games to try to interpret their uh, actions and, and also ask them to help me interpret the overall results and what they thought. And those interviews ended up being really interesting because they highlighted a lot of things that maybe my attention wouldn't necessarily have been drawn to in the data. Um, and in particular, a lot of the topics of our discussions focused around these high contributions, the large number of people who contributed everything to the public good. And so in those conversations, people highlighted some aspects of the cultural context in their village um, and the values that people hold there as being really important for explaining it. And I just wanna go through and read one of the quotes that I found particularly illuminating. So this person was responding to my question of why contributions were so high in the village compared to other places. And at first they said, well, maybe it's because we're a small community. Um, and I said, well, there are other communities where people have done these games that are also very small. So why is it that Kamchatka has higher contributions? And they said, well, we know each other here. Every person is plainly visible, like an open palm. We know him from his childhood, how he grew up. So in a big city, it's possible that they would contribute less, but here it's an entirely different matter. We live like a big family. Everyone roots for each other, survives. If someone has misfortunes, you try to support them so that that person isn't let loose. That is, reciprocity here is a very good, necessary thing. So they're really highlighting the importance of reciprocity and also the intimate connection that people have with each other living in this kind of community. Um, other people echoed these kinds of sentiments as well. And one person uh, connected this to something related to specifics of the environment. Um, they put it in a very kind of pithy way. They said, essentially, uh, people cooperated because here in the North, a loner doesn't survive. In other words, highlighting the difficult conditions under which they live and the importance that that places on cooperation. And so this got me thinking about the role of environmental context in our theories of cooperation. So how does the environment impact the decisions that they make, people make in these kinds of social dilemmas? And prior to going into the work, it wasn't something that I had thought necessarily a lot about. Um, but when I started looking back on the theories of cooperation that have been developed to explain behavior in things like the public goods game, what I found is that a lot of times this work focuses on a perspective where um, social dilemmas, the primary risk is strategic risk. 
whether or not people will cooperate or defect. And generally speaking, there's this assumption that solitary strategies not cooperating is a viable strategy in an environment, and this makes cooperation something that's problematic or, or needs a special explanation. But what people in Kamchatka and I think in other parts of the Arctic are telling us in many cases is that cooperation is, is something that is essential for living in these kinds of environment and that if you pursue a solitary strategy, that's not going to be a viable strategy for surviving. And what's interesting about this is that when you look at the, the deeper history of this kind of scholarship, I just chose this as an example, the solitary strategy perspective might be represented by somebody like Thomas Henry Huxley, who saw life as this continual free fight, the sort of struggle for existence, the Hobbesian war of each against all, a very extreme version of this idea that solitary strategies are viable. But he had a contemporary who, of course, was from Russia, Peter Kropotkin, who, important for me, also did research in Siberia, who looked at that argument and it didn't square with what he had observed both in the animal kingdom um, in his studies, but also in social and in human uh, studies that he was looking at. And so he said, even in the spots where life teemed with abundance, I failed to find, even though I was eagerly looking for it, that bitter struggle for means of existence. And of course, Kropotkin's theories of cooperation were based a lot more on in interdependence instead of independence and on mutual aid and the importance of that. So um, what I'm suggesting is these are two extreme versions, not necessarily that either one is right, but that they correspond to two different kinds of risk that people who are cooperating might face. One, a kind of strategic risk. If I cooperate, will people defect? Kind of focusing on solitary strategies. And another, focusing on the role that the environment is playing in giving risk for people. So if I don't cooperate, will I be able to survive in this environment? So um, there are some exceptions uh, to this in terms of looking at the role of environmental risks and theories of cooperation. I'm just briefly putting up here um, two studies that use agent-based modeling to show how either environmental harshness increases cooperation or how environmental uncertainty increases interdependence from people. And, and those are both interesting papers that kind of resonate with the things I'm talking about today. And there's also another area of research um, that comes from risk pooling strategies. Uh, so risk pooling in economics, human ecology, a variety of disciplines have talked about how when individuals live in a challenging environment that they can uh, are able to overcome those challenges by working together, increase their survival, but at the same time they face a difficult decision in terms of minimizing the strategic risks um, of cooperation. So with that in mind, uh, the work I'm going to talk about today worked with uh, Dr. James Murphy and Dr. Lance Howe and Dr. Colin West, so two economists from the University of Alaska Anchorage and a fellow anthropologist from North Carolina Chapel Hill. We did economic experiments and ethnographic research in Kamchatka and then also in Alaska in the Kuskokun Delta area. Today I'm just going to focus on the results from Kamchatka. So in these experiments, we did a similar standard public goods game to uh, what I had done previously in Kamchatka. And then we added a second decision where we called it a sharing decision. So people could take what they had earned from the public goods game and they could decide to share some amount of money that they earned with other people in their group. And the idea of this was to try to increase the strategic risks of the decision of what, whether or not to cooperate in the public goods game. So people played in five person groups. They were aware of who they were playing with in their group, but all the decisions were kept confidential. And I can explain methodologically how we did that later on, if that's interesting to you. Um, these were repeated round games. So we played a five round baseline where we just played a public goods game repeated, and then eight rounds where we added this sharing decision with different treatments. So um, I'll explain uh, what these treatments are, but here's sort of the overview of the different treatments that we had. And I'll just say that the idea of these different treatments was to vary the order of decisions and the information that people have available when they make the decision in a way that allows us to understand the impacts of strategic risks, the impacts of environmental risks, and as well, the interaction between them. So with that in mind, um, the, first, the first treatment that we had, we called a sharing treatment. And in that, we just played a public goods game provided people with the information about what they had earned from their group, what they kept for themselves. And then we allowed people to make a decision about um, 
who they wanted to share their earnings with within their group. So the idea of adding this sharing treatment, it increases strategic risks of cooperating in the public goods game. People might be able to use sharing as a reward to reward those people who cooperated in the public goods game. So we did this uh, repeated for eight rounds. Um, I should mention that each round, uh, people's reputations sort of reset. Um, people are not able to track uh, uh, people's reputations across round in this treatment. So what we found is that people did indeed use sharing as a reward for public good contributions. So there's a positive association between the amount somebody contributed in the public goods game and how much they received in return in sharing. So we found a significant relationship. Although the magnitude of the relationship is, is relatively modest, how did this affect levels of co cooperation? We found that the levels of cooperation remained pretty similar both across the ba baseline and the sharing treatment. So we don't see the typical decay of cooperation that is found in other places, perhaps reflecting the importance of cooperation for people in Kamchatka, but we also don't see a dramatic increase when we add in this sharing decision as a reward potentially for cooperation. So the sharing, the mechanism is apparently not strong enough to increase levels of cooperation, even though people are rewarding people who cooperate more. So our next treatment, um, I guess my slides are a bit out of order here. Our next treatment, what we did is we, uh, we added treatment two here. Uh, we play, had people play the public goods game and then before we shared the results of the game, one person from each group was randomly selected to receive what we call the shock. So what that meant is that they lost all of their earnings from the public goods game and uh, were left uh, with no earnings. Then we asked people to determine who they wanted to share with in their group. So when they make the sharing decision in our second treatment, the only information they have is who in the group has lost their earnings, who in the group is in need. They don't know what those people have contributed to the public goods. They just make their sharing decision based on who is in need or not. Um, then once they've made their decision, they receive information about who contributed to the public goods and who shared with whom. So skipping ahead to the results, we found is that levels of sharing were pretty similar between the two treatments overall. However, when we divide up the level of sharing between who has received a shock and who has not received a shock, you can see overwhelmingly that people are preferentially directing their sharing to people who have received the shock. So they're responding to this as a signal of need um, and sharing more with those people. So uh, our third treatment combines both of these two kinds of risks and allows them to interact with one another. So in the third treatment, people play the public goods game, they learn the results, then we randomly select one person who loses all of their earnings, then they make a sharing decision and decide how much to share with people in their group. So when they make the sharing decision in the third treatment, they can either use what someone has contributed to the public good as a guide, they can use whether or not somebody has been shocked as a guide, or they can use both of those things together. So what we found is that similar to the sharing treatment, there's a positive relationship between how much someone contributed to the public good and how much they received from other people in sharing, but this relationship is only for the people who receive a shock or the people that have lost their earnings and are in need of help from other people. So in other words, if you uh, did not suffer this misfortune of losing your earnings, people were directing very little sharing towards you. But when you did suffer this misfortune, the amount that you received depended on how much you had contributed to the public goods game in that round. So the people who contributed more received more help. The people who contributed less received less help. So uh, we took it a step further in this, in this version of the game and we added a fourth treatment. We call this the reputation treatment. It's identical to the third treatment that I just described, but in this one, we allowed people's reputations to accumulate across rounds. So I, again, I won't explain exactly how they did this. It's kind of interesting, but it's, it takes a little while to explain. Um, but you can trust us that we allowed people to accumulate these reputations without sort of violating their confidentiality in the decision game. And the idea here is that we wanted to make the game have the kind of reputation dynamics that we know exist in real life when people are interacting repeatedly over time. So the results of this experiment were very similar. 
Um, essentially, what we found is that, again, people are preferentially sharing with those in need. And when people are in need, they receive a lot more when they have been uh, good contributors to the public good and less when they have been, been not as great contributors to the public good. And so the magnitude of the relationship is always is also much stronger, which is interesting. Um, so uh, just kind of taking a step back, um, one of the interesting things about the reputation is that we can also look at these, these effects over time. And so in a current round, what you have contributed to the public good matters, but it also matters what you contributed last round and there's even a positive relationship with what you contributed two rounds ago, even though it uh, doesn't approach statistical significance. So people are see seeming to track each other's um, behaviors over multiple rounds, which is interesting. We also looked at reputations through the sharing decision. So if people were more generous in sharing with others, helping them out, did they also receive more when they were in need? And we found evidence of that going back two and three rounds as well. Um, so this reputation seems to be something that's important for people to track. Um, so what is the end result in terms of risk pooling? So in all versions of the game where people lost earnings due to this shock that we instituted, people earned less than people who did not receive the shock. So we don't see perfect risk pooling in terms of equality, but we do see substantial amounts of earnings from people who had lost everything because of the generosity of other people in their group. So you can see also that as we've made the game more closer to real life, adding in the ability to monitor reputation, strategic risks, combining with this environmental risk, the levels of risk pooling increase as well. So it's not risk pooling, but it does seem to show that when we add in these kinds of dynamics that we would expect from theories of risk pooling, that we get better uh, levels of outcomes for people. So we also did interviews after this, and and some of these results kind of resonated with what people told us, and some people even highlighted the way in which this was a unique aspect of life in the community and something that they appreciated uh, above and beyond uh, life, perhaps in another area like a city. So one person talked about living in the city a few years ago and always being in these situations where they needed help, and they didn't have anything like this, this idea of helping people in need. They rented an apartment. There wasn't anyone they could ask for food or for help when they needed it. But here in the village, it's different. When they're in critical situations, it's easier. They know that they can uh, go to people for help. So this was kind of resonating with this idea of need-based sharing and, and reciprocal um, aid and mutual aid as an important part of culture for people here. Um, we have an interesting result along these lines from Alaska, but I'm, I'm gonna kind of skip over it um, in the interest of time. Um, and I'll just uh, conclude here by saying that, that one of the things that we're taking home from this result is that many of the theories of cooperation we develop, develop around an idea of an individual, and that's been criticized a lot uh, by scholars of the commons talking about moving beyond a rational actor, trying to incorporate details of social and cultural context. Um, but the same is true in terms of theories of cooperation of the environment that people live in. So our idea of an environment is relatively um, relatively basic in many of these models and that it assumes that a solitary individual can survive. And so cooperation becomes a problem to explain. But when people live in environments that are challenging, that require them to work together, this increases interdependence among them. And this alone can be a powerful stimulus for cooperation. So we're not suggesting that whenever conditions get tough that people will always come together, but there has to be some role for environmental uncertainty, environmental risk in our theories of cooperation if we're going to accommodate um, the kinds of situations at least that we've seen in places like Kamchatka. So what that means is maybe a shift in our research away from uh, an approach that strictly draws on things like political economy and a broader perspective that draws on human ecology, by which I mean uh, inclusive perspectives from cultural ecology, political ecology, behavioral ecology, things that emphasize the link between environmental conditions and the social institutions, the cultural norms and values that motivate people's behavior. So in this case, uh, in Kamchatka, the difficult social and environmental conditions seem to increase interdependence among people. People have values of helping people who are in need, and this shapes how they approach uh, these kinds of experiments that we've used today.
Um, so with that, uh, I wanted to end, and I'm happy to elaborate on any aspect of it. We have time and the questions, but before I do that, I wanted to first and foremost thank the people in Kamchatka and Alaska who participated in this project, my collaborators, Lance Howe, Jim Murphy, Colin West, uh, people in Kamchatka and Alaska who assisted our work, and all the institutions that have supported it along the way. Um, if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them now, or if you have questions, you can send me an email or uh, send me a message on Twitter or something like that. And I also just want to thank everyone who participated in this event, whether this webinar or any of the other webinars. Of course, all the people like Charlie who helped organize this. It's, it's been an interesting experience, and I hope it's something that, that we're able to do again. So with that, I'll take any questions people have. So Drew, given um, uh, participants don't have uh, a mic, I'm going to clap for you on behalf of all the participants that just heard your talk. That was really a terrific uh, talk and way to, way to uh, close out the, the day. It was really a really nice one. Um, so I've got uh, the Q&A window open, uh, mm -hmm. and there's a couple questions in there. Um, so I'm going to uh, um, just choose one. I guess I'm looking at the one that just came in. Um, and then maybe I'll move up. Um, if any, uh, okay, here we go. If any, who are good slash interesting philosophers to read who are either proto-commoners, perhaps those influential to commons concepts, or part of the common sphere in some way? Um, let me see if I can cut that out and put it in chat so you can read it, Drew. Yeah, I, I can see the Q and A. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, in terms of philosophers, it's sort of outside of my area. Although I do try to read some of it. I mean, one thing I would say is that in the context of Russia, people like Kropotkin have been writing about these kinds of issues and issues of cooperation and commons dilemmas for a long time. And interestingly, a lot of these people were. Uh, philosophers, other people were uh, very influential figures uh, leading up to the Soviet Revolution. So um, Alexander Herzen, uh, Mikhail Bakunin, the, the anarchist, uh, Kropotkin, there, there are a whole list of interesting Russian figures, some people you may have heard of, other people who are less heard of who have talked about these kind of things. And of course, we have uh, similar figures uh, in sort of the more like Western European kind of canon. But the other thing I would add is, is in terms of interesting philosophers is that many indigenous peoples have been talking about these issues for a long time and have uh, been, you know, their cultural values have been shaped by these sorts of things. And there's been a resurgence recently in taking the perspectives of these people seriously in terms of re-examining our theories of cooperation. I think, you know, as somebody who works in the Arctic, you see, many of these kinds of themes about helping people in need, about the importance of, of sharing, and how it's a cultural value that extends above and beyond simple kind of economic interests. So I would say, you know, read lots of the, the work that's being done by, by contemporary indigenous scholars, and also the work that uh, comes from people who have worked with indigenous communities, whether it's ethnographers or indigenous scholars. Um, so that would be my answer to that question. <laughs> Great, Drew. So uh, there, as you see, there's others Q and A, but I'm just I, I've noticed that there's a, a phone in call listener that I hadn't noticed before. And for that person, if you have a question, you can uh, type in star nine, and that would raise your hand, and I could give you I could unmute you. So I, I'll just look for that. But um, Drew, just because the other participants can't see the questions. I think I'm going to turn to one where it says, interesting theory on evidence on cooperation driven by dire environmental settings. Could this port over to other situations such as hard economic times? And as I saw that question, I was thinking, um, you know, the, the temporal nature of, of, you know, environmental conditions uh, and the importance of that. But um, so I immediately thought of um, maybe something like the Great Recession or you know something longer term that might lead to uh, so so the question is you know could there be other things outside of maybe uh, natural environment conditions that could lead to some of the findings you found? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. And I mean, my first uh, 
my first thing would say would be to say yes let's do those those studies as well but um, one thing that I found when I was uh, trying to interpret the high contributions to my initial public goods games in Kamchatka I was looking through and trying to see if there had been any other studies that had documented these levels of cooperation and one of the ones that I found that had the highest levels of cooperation um, was a study I believe it was uh, Jeffrey Carpenter did a study in uh, an urban uh, slum in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam and there also there were high levels of cooperation coupled with difficult economic conditions uh, although in an urban context and so I found that very interesting it's you know hard to to link the two or to say that there's some causality there but you know it'd be really interesting to compare you know people living in difficult conditions of different kinds whether it's in a remote part of Siberia or whether in an urban large city context. Okay, great. Um, so I'm still looking at the questions, but um, um, another one is uh, simply states interesting experiments. What's next? So do you want to <laughs> reflect on where you're headed um, next with this work? Yeah. Um, well, I haven't done any experiments since these, although we did uh, do more experiments, similar experiments in Alaska. For me, the thing that has been really interesting is to see the work that that people have been doing to really try to link what goes on in the experiments to cooperation that occurs outside of the experiments and more naturally occurring contexts. So um, I'm always interested to see new studies that experiment with ways of framing the game to make those connections clear or ways of gathering data on people's behavior outside of the experiments and seeing if that correlates in some way to how they play the game. Um, so I think that is an area of research that I'd like to see a lot more of um, moving away maybe from the idea that these games are just sort of an abstract measure of cooperativeness that we can apply just about anywhere to really designing games that are designed to, to tailor to the specific dilemmas and, and cultural and historical contexts of the people who are playing them. Great. Um, still looking just to make sure uh, no new posts, but um, I, I think um, one other question that may be off the screen that I, I read um, was uh, the connection between experimental economics and anthropology. Um, I, you had one slide that um, I know had like a list of a lot of studies that I think you said were anthropological studies. Um, so how long has that connection been made and or is this a relatively new intersection between what I've always thought is two different fields? Yeah, approaches. that's a great question. Um, it is a relatively new thing for anthropologists to do. Um, when I was in graduate school and was designing my project around this time, um, there was a group of anthropologists uh, sort of spearheaded by Joe Henrik and some of his collaborators who designed, uh, they had done some of these experiments in areas where they worked in Latin America and then designed a collective project where a group of anthropologists, ethnographers, um, took these experiments out into the field in their field sites where they had been doing ethnographic work for a long time and uh, published the results of it, I believe, in 2004 in the book called The Foundations of Human Sociality. And so I read that as a grad student and thought it was a really interesting way of trying to uh, find a way to get measures of cooperation that maybe are easier to compare in one place to the next but at the same time can be modified and linked up with the specific cultural context. So there were lots of people, um, a few studies in that, that uh, people spontaneously identified connections between the structure of the dilemma in the game and dilemmas that they face in their real life that are kind of classic commons dilemmas or public goods dilemmas. And that was where I kind of got the idea of framing these games in terms of these post-Soviet collective institutions. And since that time, I know they've done a second round of projects. There have been a lot of other anthropologists like me who have used these games in collaborations with economists. Like I said, the whole bulk of this presentation in the second half was this collaboration with economists at the University of Alaska Anchorage. So I think it's a, a interesting way in which this method kind of brings people from different disciplines, different backgrounds together. and and kind of uh, gives them a common structure to have, you know, debates about how to interpret these results and what they all mean in terms of our theories. Indeed. Um, so unless there's another, I'm just watching to see if anybody has any last question to close out the session. 
It looks like uh, not seeing anything new. So um, given we're at about the end date, end time, I, I let me, um, if, if you don't mind, take a minute just to uh, close out this entire week. Um, so Drew, uh, you know, on behalf of uh, the International Association of the Study of the Commons, and for all the World Commons Week organizers, I'd like to thank all attendees that have been on this call and on this webinar and, and, and Drew for uh, preparing and giving what was a really nice talk. Um, really enjoyed it. And uh, in closing, I just want to remind people who are on the call on the webinar that uh, there are two upcoming IASC events, both, both of which are advertised on the top of the worldscommonsweek.org website. Um, the first is uh, in November, mid-November, IASC is holding its first virtual conference. This is being run by Marco Johansson at ASU. And I think there's still a call for participation. Uh, again, you can find that link in the top of worldscommonsweek.org in the top left corner. And then in July 2019, IASC is holding its biannual uh, in-person conference in Lima, Peru. And the deadline for paper abstracts is now due on November 15th, 2018, so about a month away. Um, so keep an eye on that. We, we hope, hope uh, to see, see people there. And in conclusion for the week, I just want to thank my team of moderators here at UMass, without whom uh, we would not have been able to pull off 24 straight successful noontime webinars. Um, the team is Ainsley Brosnan Smith, Dylan Cotonino, Bia Diaz, Kobe Frangilo, and Maxine Gunther Seagull. And uh, if it wasn't for that team, we would not have we would not have done what we've just done and what we're what uh, the, we, we've actually had 24 successful webinars. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful for their efforts. They really um, were amazing. And with this webinar end, it closes the first ever IASC World's Comms Week. So we're already hearing a buzz about doing another in 2019. Um, Drew, I hope you'll participate again. And uh, I hope the uh, other people on the call will participate either as attendees or uh, in, in other ways. So on behalf of IASC and the World Commons Week organizing team, thank you for attending this and, and thanks all and we'll see you next year. I'm gonna close, close the meeting. Thanks, Drew. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.